S&P continues to consolidate despite massive volatility. NASDAQ forming a flag under major resistance. Bitcoin holds 30,000. What the Bitcoin stocks are telling us. NVIDIA continues to confuse investors. What sparked the best performing sector on Friday? What the last hour is telling us. Corporate insiders continue to buy the NDX. What Carvana and Rivian have in common. Semiconductors continue to fight a critical level. Why the real estate sector may be forming a bottom? We have a lot to cover. Let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome back. So the S&P held this critical level. We easily could have sold down, but we did not. And I think it's important to just kind of go through a couple things here. We're looking at a weekly chart. So we rally up, try to get over, can't, pulls back half, encapsulates the next day, and now we're filling this area in. So let's really take a look at this. And I, do I get into this kind of detail? Yep, I actually do. So what I'm curious about is we're over, but we can't close up here again, right? But look at this move on this bar. We're not sitting here. In other words, this bar pops up, then we only get this wick. And as we like to say here, wicks are what? Price rejection, right? We all know that. So then we have that bar, which is not ideal. And then this bar can't close over and closes in the low, giving us a sign that maybe we're gonna retest here. Instead, we undercut, take everybody's supply, right? We take everybody's stock right here. And then what do we do? we gap up and then make people think that we're gonna possibly push and go sideways. Now, the one thing I will say about this bar that I think is very important, you're right around that 50% level on that bar. And I think that's a very important distinction. So it's not like you have completely blown out and you're near the lower end of this bar. And even that wick right here, it didn't make it all the way down. So I, I kind of like the positioning of the index. I know a lot of people are upset because we sold off on Fridays. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. We're gonna go through one chart that's gonna explain it in great detail. But I think if we look at this on the daily, yeah, I mean, I get it. I understand not being excited about having a shooting star up here against a support or resistance level, right? Like that's that's not ideal. If we look into this, and this is a 12, this is a 22, and this is a 55. That's what I use, they're SMAs. You should use whatever you want. Am I, am I crazy about that, that that's how we closed? No, it is what it is. I mean, there's not really a whole heck of a lot to do with that. You have some economic uncertainty out there. We're gonna go over a little bit of that, but you really have a lot of geopolitical instability right now, and you're seeing some issues with that. So it's definitely something that I'm gonna pay attention to, and I think it's a little more than people People think it is and I don't know that people are going to want to go long into the weekends so we might start seeing this on Fridays and then we just want to start going through the Fridays and seeing if you start seeing that pattern we're not really seeing that pattern yet right of get me out on Friday every Friday we it was kind of like that here then this Friday everybody had to get in this one we're out we're not really seeing a, a, a major pattern of just every Friday get out, but we are seeing some of these patterns where, you know, here we are, Friday, low of the day, low of the day, low of the day. So we want to be cognizant of that. When we start to see that, why are you getting out during the weekends? What, what are you expecting to happen, right? There might be something out there that people are concerned about. So we as investors and traders have to pay attention to that. Now, if you take a look at the NASDAQ, and I just want to take a second and say thanks to everybody that's been sharing these videos. I actually get emails from people now that are saying, hey, so-and-so shared this, so please keep sharing it. I specifically do not run ads, so it, you are not bothered by this. You're never gonna see like a Cobra trading ad in the middle of one of my videos, uh, despite how many times they reach out to me to do that. Uh, not just them, but other people as well. But if you take a look at how we're coming down and we're moving higher, right? It's really important to get that. Comes down, undercuts. We were going to flush, perfect spot to flush. We didn't. Am I crazy about Friday's close? No, no, I'm not. But it is what it is. I mean, I don't put a lot of weight behind a close like this at the end of the week on a short week in July, but I know people are just going, you know what, I'm gonna trade till lunchtime and then I'm just gonna go away. And if you take a look at what happened here and we just really kind of, let's do it on a 15 and we're gonna get rid of these levels right here. And if you kind of just look at what happened, we just kind of fell out of bed right around here, right around that 130, right? If you're done trading at lunch and everyone's like, you know what, just get, get me out of the market. And I think you saw a little bit of that, but I don't know that it was just massive selling. I just think it was apathy, lack of buying. Why do I need to own NVIDIA here, right? Why do I have to buy it up here? 
Um, that's what you just saw. You just saw that massive dump. And again, this is not shocking if you understand behavior of trading. So if you have a 45 degree angle like this, right, this is as much fun as this is to trade. They never end well. When you're riding up like this, you have no base. You have no support. So what happens, This you can set up for something like that. Versus if you start building some support and then break out, right, you'll, you'll, do, you'll fare a little bit better. I'm not saying that you're not gonna have these huge moves. I'm leaving pre and post in for right now. That's why you see the different colors. But it, when you start having those kinds of days like this, where you're just like, oh, we're gonna rally up, consolidates, well, you consolidate and then you pop. Consolidates, pops, right? Reversal kind of goes from there. So you always want some kind of support on these names, and then you wanna utilize that support. When you don't have support, you know, you could step into some pretty wild moves there, right? Support or resistance. So how do I feel about what's going on with NVIDIA right now? A lot of people are getting frustrated with Doji City up here, right? Everyone's a Doji. Dojis are signs of what? Uncertainty. Okay. This had a monster move, despite what I may think of it and despite what other people might think of it. I think it's going to be an absolute monster over the next three to five years. I really do. That does not mean that we're not going to have volatility. Now, if you look at the weeks and you've owned this for the majority of the past, let's call it six weeks since it came up, you've got nothing but aggravation. Right? I mean, you, you start on Monday and then you're down. I mean, if you just think about it from this perspective, you start on Monday, then you're down. Then you, you hold this week and then you're flat after being down. Now you're second guessing yourself. Then you, you, you finally get a good week where you get a movement out of it and then it stops. And then you have three weeks where it has you know these major drops down to 400, back to 420, right? And then you're getting these other dojis. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is it's it's somewhat maddening if you're trading this because you're just, you're waiting for it to do something and it's not. It's just digesting the move. You, you have to understand you're at all time highs up here. People don't even know how to evaluate the stock right now. And that's a big issue. People are looking at the PE. But if you really look at the analysts, they're saying we have no idea because we don't know what kind of growth we're going to see next quarter. That's a real problem with NVIDIA. And you're seeing that spill into NQ. And I do want to get into some things that I'm not crazy about here. But if I if I look at this right now, all I have is just a flag and I'm not even making lower lows. I do see th this with the RSI. I mean, I do know that we are all the way up here and I do think that that is an issue. And I do think it's something that we need to pay attention to, but that doesn't mean I can't stay up here for months or weeks. And so I don't wanna be that person that's just gonna call the top, right? If you follow us on Twitter or you follow me on Twitter, we talked about this at nauseum. And that's one thing, all these videos are connected. So if this is something that interests you and you want actual information where we actually go through what it takes to be successful trading, you probably wanna to subscribe to the channel. But if you look at that level right here that we talked about, right in there, that's CPI, when CPI came out. We've never looked back, right? One of the charts I keep showing is what happened in 1983, what happened in 1995, and I keep hearing this time it's different. I'm not gonna go through my whole history lesson that I went through previously, but what I want people to get from this is, if you didn't call the bottom, don't call the top, okay? It's pointless. I'm not saying that's not a possible short-term top. I mean, by any definition, when you get to a resistance point, if you're any kind of technician at all, you have to look at that and go, well, that's not good, we just stopped there, right? And then you have wicks. Well, wicks are what? Price rejection, right? So then you look at it and go, well, we're not really breaking down. What's happening? Well, we're getting stronger, all right? So you might drill into that a little bit more and go, okay, well, what's the volume look like, right? And then start drilling into the volume. Well, the volume, so if you look at the volume and you go, well, the last four weeks, we've just had major buying. Well, is the selling encapsulating the buying or is the buying encapsulating the selling? So how far back do I have to go to even find on the weekly chart where the selling is encapsulating the buying. I'd have to go back to October. What happened in October? The bottom. Okay, so you have an exhaustion move. Usually that's what happens. You get these big exhaustion spikes and that's your bottom. And then just look going forward. You had a period in here in December, you had all that tax selling, right? And then in January, you haven't really looked back. You've just had constant buying and your weeks are always surpassed your selling weeks are always surpassed by your buying weeks. So the idea that I'm gonna look at this and go, you know what, this is gonna stop now. 
I'm gonna, it's definitely gonna stop right now and I'm gonna change and I'm gonna go short. I, I wish you the best of luck. I, I've never had any luck predicting what the market's gonna do. The best thing I can do is analyze the market and then make the best decision possible. That, that has made me fairly decent at trading, doing it that way. The, the idea that you're gonna just call the top and now we're an economist and we're gonna get into the non-farm payrolls nonsense in a moment here. I think you need to focus on things like this and just say, I'm at a resistance point, I'm eating up supply and for whatever reason, they're buying, they're not selling, they've been doing it all month and these little red bars on the weekly, if you're not looking at weekly charts, you're really missing out on a lot. So you might wanna add that to your, your arsenal of things that you do. Run through all your stocks, look at them at, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, when the month hits, look at them at the end of the month. It makes a huge difference to just get perspective on what's really going on. So you look at that and go, what's really happening? Well, my belief is that we're eating up supply and that eventually we'll lift. But that doesn't mean that that's what's gonna happen. But that's my thesis going into this. And I think people are grossly underestimating the power of a couple things out there. Number one, the inflationary environment no longer really exists despite what people are thinking. Number two, you have a driver like you haven't had in about two decades through AI. Now, I wanna talk about that for a moment because I'm seeing this with Microsoft a little bit where we're seeing people talk about Microsoft as, oh, well, this chat G GPT, they're not 10% you know, dropped. It was just a novelty. It's already starting to stop being used. Okay, this is not why you'd buy Microsoft because of the chat GPT or BARD, or that's not why you'd buy Google. Understand that Microsoft and Google, in order to keep their market share, are going to have to compete with one another. The only way they're going to be able to compete with one another is if they have the same technology or better technology is the goal, right? Okay, so this whole thing where I'm gonna to talk to an AI and it's gonna type me a sonnet that I can give to a girl, is I could care less about that, right? Or you're gonna write my newsletter. I'm interested in how are they gonna get more efficient with their company? So when Stanley Druckenmiller was talking about his NVIDIA position, and I'd recommend anybody listen to that, just go on YouTube and go Google Stanley Druckenmiller or Bloomberg and listen to it around the 17 minute mark. So if you look at 1742, actually, so if you go and take a look at this, right, and you see this, and now 10% of his net worth is in this trade, okay. When he talks about it, he's looking out two to three years, and what he says, is he says, well, right now it's making developers seven to eight times more productive. It's been six months and they're already seven to eight times more productive developers. It's really hard to say that I don't wanna buy these kinds of companies like NVIDIA or AVGO because chat GPT volume dropped down. If, you are, or if you're selling AI stocks based upon that, you don't understand AI and what's really gonna drive this. Names like AVGO, there are, on, there are only certain companies that make certain things, right? AVGO has a very specific product. So that means that we'd wanna focus on that name as well. ASML makes wafers. Now, we're gonna talk about this because I think this is significant. They make those wafers. Those wafers right now are $20,000 a piece at, for this cutting edge NVIDIA. So they're the only ones that make that wafer. Okay, so that's something that you have to understand, like they have to use ASML. It's not like you can just go to Bob's store and pick up another wafer. The only person that can assemble this is Taiwan Semi. They're the only people that can assemble this whole thing. They're the only people that can keep it together, right? So when you start seeing like China, Taiwanese tensions, you understand it could completely disrupt global supply chain. Right, it would be an issue. There's a reason why Taiwan Semi is opening up places all over the world now. Now, if we take a look at that without getting down the, the geopolitical rabbit hole, you're holding in here, but ASML is not really holding, right? We're starting to roll here. This is a nine. I don't use a, use a nine usually on an EMA. I'm gonna go here to the weeklies, right? But you did see how that daily's rolling there, but I want you to see this. We're encapsulating here. That's, that's not ideal. Right. If I start looking at the socks, I'm having trouble with 500. That's not ideal. Now, as I'm telling you that I, I like NVIDIA, I'm looking at NVIDIA long term. We have a position in the Alpha Chasers community in NVIDIA, and I know my pronunciation skills are not the best. You guys are just going to have to roll with me on that. But if you look at this and you look at that flag, well, that's a beautiful flag. 
okay, well, why, why am I closing at the lower ends of this? Why can't I get over that 500? Am I eating up supply here? And then I'm gonna get over that? I don't know, I don't have an answer for that. But I broke down, tried to rally, and since that, we've been unable to close above this level. So I have to watch that, right? You've been unable to close up there. Now, there was a period in time, and I'll just drop this in, where you were at that third standard deviation, right? And everybody remember these standard deviations from maybe a couple weeks ago? New people are probably not gonna know what I'm talking about, but standard deviation, so this is your 20 line, that becomes your, your guide, right? Then one standard deviation is 67%, meaning you're, there's a 67% chance you're gonna stay in that range. Two is 95%, there's a 95% chance you're gonna stay in that range. Three is 99.7% you're gonna stay in that range, okay? So when you pop out over there, like we were along the socks, this is where we sold SOXL or trimmed it, just because there's only a 0.3% chance that I'm gonna push higher over the next week. Nobody's taking that bet right? It, you're just not. So if you take a look at it from that perspective, you're not taking that bet if you know that, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, it's definitely something to keep in mind. So I don't know, but if you look at this on the daily now, I'm rolling and I'm pointing down. Well, I, I, I can't be feeling great about this. And I just want to point that out. And if we don't have a driver, right, then that means that we could have an issue here. Like we need semis to at least go sideways. They don't have to go up, but they need to go sideways. And I'm not so sure that when, when I go through all this, that we might not see some kind of pullback. So if I take a look, like take a look at Lamb, we did very well with this trade if you were following along how it rallied up, pulled back, but look at where I'm at now. Now I'm starting to close below the 22, I'm starting to close below the 12. Okay, I broke right here. Okay, so now I've got this negative divergence that, that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy about my, you know, my thought process right now. I start looking at KLAC. I'm below the 12 and the 22, and I'm hanging on to this for dear life, but I already broke here. So the probability of, you know, a sell is pretty much there. You start looking at AMAT, and again, now, now here I am again, right? Am I going to crack here? Probably, right? Now I've got this gravestone doji sitting right up here against the 22 after this hammer. So when I start putting these pieces together, this is why I always say, I can map out, I can predict what I think is going to happen, right? That's not gonna make me money. What's gonna make me money is analyzing what's actually happening and understand what this is telling me, right? Because why would I wanna be up here buying AMAT if it's gonna crack and give me a shot at 128, okay? Same thing with AMD. We talked about this and been talking about AMD for a period of time. This devil horns pattern up here, tries to rally, gets to the face, can't get over the 12, can't get over the 22. These are classic signs, gap fills, and now I'm in the minutia. Now, there's a couple things here. That does not mean that I'm going to crack. We're going back down to 60 or 80. It just means that you might go sideways for a while, or you might trend down on some of those names. And I think that's the point that I'm getting at here, but you need to be looking at this stuff and going, what exactly is going on here, right? We're, we're, we're pretty much moving ahead with tech. Tech's pretty much flying, right? We all know that. And make sure you get the newsletter, it's free. There'll be a link in description and also pinned in comments. It's a pretty good newsletter, walking through a couple things uh, this week. And there'll be updates this week coming up. But you see what's going on right here? Now I'm below here. Well, why, why would I want to battle this right now? SOXL was a trade that I looked at the other day and I said, you know, it might be a great time to try to buy this. You're at, like I'll show you. When we were trading in the room, I said, what a great spot to try and get involved. It came down to this level, right? Gave us an opportunity to try to buy SOXL and get involved. Well, that's, that's great to try to pick this off. But I've got some issues here now, and maybe you guys see them, maybe you don't. So I'm just going to point them out. So we're going to remove the drawings. I'm going to click on this, and you know you're looking at SOXL, right? But just take a look at this for a moment. Okay, so when you have necklines, they don't have to be straight. But that's a left shoulder, that's a head, that's a right shoulder. You know, as somebody that's playing in semis, I'm not looking at this and going, oh, that's great, I feel good. So, and here's my neckline. And then you overlay that with this, is that something that I feel the need that I have to rush into? No, it's not. And now my other concern is what I see happening uh, 
what I personally see happening in, in the last hour of trading, which would be probably a really good segue to get into right now. So this is the last hour of trading. And this is by Sediment Trader. I just want to have all this up here so that you can actually see who it is. They have it down here, but you can see it here. It's a, this is a paid service. I did already talk to them and make sure it was okay that I, I went through this with everybody. But what this is telling you is what happens at the last hour. And it's cumulative, meaning it tells us what to expect every last hour hour of every single day. And if you're up, it's plus one. If it's down, it's minus one. Just think of it that way. Well, when we started rallying here, I kept saying, hey, when we're doing this, we're setting up to rally. And you could see right here that this obviously peaked way before we're up here, right? Which tells us that we're going under accumulation. Well, now we're starting to see some sideways action and maybe we're gonna hold in here, maybe we're not. But what we don't want to do, and what we want to keep an eye on is, I don't want to see this. Now, this is a long-term indicator. Let me be really clear about that. This is a long-term indicator. This is not something that you're going to trade on Tuesday or Wednesday because this is what's happening. So just keep that in mind, okay? This is something that's extremely long-term. And what we're trying to do is get a sense of what to do about it, okay? So the purpose of this is for us to understand well, that last hour of trading that we we're just talking about what's happening on Fridays, are we going to start seeing more selling like this? I don't have an answer for you. If I look at the last year, you can see how this is a precursor to what happens, right? You can, you can say it. And it's definitely there. And there's a high correlation. If I was to run a correlation on this, you're going to see a high correlation, but it takes time. So you drill in over three and you can see that well the last hour we had nothing but selling all the time and when did it, we really peak well we peaked when it when it troughed right and then okay well when did it start hitting highs well it started hitting highs when this started happening right and then we were taken out a lower low divergences are everywhere and you know the sooner that people start using those divergences the better off they'll be the happier they'll be i'll, I'll put it, I'll, I'll say it that way so like for example you can see right here this divergence right and then you can see it right down here so divergences are everywhere and you always want to be looking for them because they tell you more about the underlying fundamentals of the market than anything else anyway if you take a look at this and you can see that right there but you can see really clear what are we doing we're sloping down. What are we doing here? Well, this could take months. And this doesn't mean that we're going to drop next week. But this is not what I want to see. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see us getting to a level like we did here, right? And then now we're getting to that point again, and we can't stop. So that's a problem. And it's definitely something that we want to pay attention to. Okay, so we know where we are with semiconductors. We know that there may be an issue here. We know we have to keep our eye on this. Meanwhile, the NASDAQ is moving higher. So now we have to go and say, okay, well, what, what, is, what is moving higher? And is it something that we can participate in? So then you go and take a look at XBI, which is the biotech set space. That doesn't look like anything I would go near. So then you go and take a look at cloud. Well, we're kind of hanging in there with cloud, right? We're kind of hanging in there with software. Where, where I saw a lot of money going, and it's still holding in there is legacy tech. So I started looking for legacy tech, but you know, maybe it's at a point where we're gonna do some rotation into some other names, and maybe there's some reasoning for that. So one of the things I noticed was that a lot of these Bitcoin names are moving, a lot of them. This is one that we bought in the community. I think we paid 340 for it. Uh, so we're doing well with it, but this is just getting started in my opinion. And I'm just going to walk through what my thesis is here. You have this GBTC that this appellate court's coming out. I'm not a lawyer. I'll be real clear about that. I'm just going to say that I think they have a really good chance of winning this appeal. If they, And I think that's why you're seeing all these ETFs, because they're going to win their appeal. If they win their appeal, obviously GBTC goes higher. I think that they will. I have no way of knowing that. I think what something like a MicroStrategies could do is actually spin off their Bitcoin in a separate unit. I think a lot of people could do that. And if you start looking at the people that are holding these, it is a great way to, for them to actually monetize that. It makes so much sense. And I think that they're going to start doing it. But I think they're all waiting to see what happens with this GPTC case. Now, if I look at what's happening here, 
we're roughly trading at the market cap of the Bitcoin and we're completely throwing away the company and saying the company's worth zero, even though it does over $100 million a quarter. So remember, this was at roughly around 130 before it had even ever bought Bitcoin. And right now it's just trading at its Bitcoin value. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. I'm wondering if these names are going to be the driver. Now, I don't think that they're going to be enough of the driver. This is one we've been playing with a lot. Uh, I don't know that they're going to be enough of the driver to keep us going. I, I don't know that. Uh, but it could keep us going for a little bit of time, why they wash out, and then we ro rotate back into semiconductors and software. I don't know that just a big push in these Bitcoin names is going to do what we want it to do. But you are seeing, you are seeing interest in these names and they technically are setting up very nicely so that's one area that i see where we could see some kind of balance now if you take a look at something like rivian and this is one that i just want to go through this and show you this volume because this volume was just you never had volume like this ever again this is something that we actually bought in the community and did fairly well with still in it i i think this could be an absolute monster for a couple different reasons but you know i don't want to get into all that what i'm trying to do is explain where i think the themes are going if you take a look at this and you look at that volume spike on that delivery that means one thing right you have massive volume you know you're talking about what 500 million shares okay that is not twitter okay that is institutional interest in that name saying i need to get involved I need to get involved in this or I need to cover my short one or the other. But that amount of buying is substantive and I would strongly suggest you pay attention to it. Now, this theme, it could carry over. I don't know that it's going to carry over into the lucids of the world. They have their own issues. I'm not saying to go out and buy that. I know a lot of people were watching the XPEV. That These charts that I'm showing right here, like NIO, okay, I still have my theme that I think a lot of these are gonna to go to zero. That doesn't mean they all go to zero. And that means that my thought process on that, I had to reevaluate what I thought of Rivian once I saw these numbers, because the numbers were substantial and it, they're clearly on target. So what could drive the market, what could be another driver of the market would be names like Rivian, where we're just, we're just wrong, or I should say I was wrong in thinking that they really didn't have like a key product and they weren't gonna be able to get it together because of the costs. Another one that you're seeing exactly like this is Carvana. Now with Carvana, we're not seeing that weekly volume spike, but look at this on the daily and look at Friday's volume, right? Little bit trying to get there, but here, let's pull this up. Look at that move, but it's not huge volume. Well, we had selling in here for five days, and now that little bit of volume moved it, what, $4? So if that little bit of volume is gonna move it $4, what's gonna happen when this happens, right? If, you, if someone comes in during the weekend and sees that and says, I wanna be involved, what's gonna happen then? Again, my thought process with Carvana is that people have it wrong. Now for me, what was very obvious was that this was something I was short for a very long period of time. It became very clear right here when they started talking about what they were making per car now, that my short thesis was done. And I wound up closing it and start playing with it on the long side. But from up here, when they were borrowing money and everything else, it was a beautiful short and I did quite well with it. But this whole story changed this day. I'm not so sure people don't get the fact that they have to start looking at fund analysis and start drilling into these companies. You know, I keep saying this, and I'm gonna say it again, we don't have $1.7 trillion behind us, right? That means things are going to bounce around. Like when, when you're trading high yield bonds now, I was trying to explain this the other day, and I'll just walk through it because it's so, it's so significant. This is the Fed, okay? That's why everything's so tight. This is the Fed buying high yield bonds. That's why it's so tight. Okay, they weren't starting here, right? They started in here. You see how tight it started getting? And then what happens when they stop buying? It collapsed. Now what's happening? You're getting wilder and wilder. Even here where you're starting to base is getting wilder, right? So you're going to see this because you're gonna see more volatility than you've ever seen before. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, you're in an environment that you've, most people that are listening to this video have not never seen. Okay, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be around a while trading and I've seen a lot of different scenarios. So, you know, just understand from, if you look at the 10 year, right? And you just go from here, 
over, from 11 over to here, this period of time, okay, roughly 10 years, 12 years, you had zero interest rates until you got to here, to where you are right now. So if you've been trading for this period of time, the only thing you know is zero interest rates and the Fed's got your back, right? Because the Fed's gonna buy assets, they're gonna buy bonds, they're gonna buy mortgages, okay? You don't have the, you don't have the Fed and you don't have zero interest rates. So you're gonna to have to start going back to periods of time and looking at like the 10 year and go, well, was there more volatility or less volatility during that period of time, okay? And I'll just point this out so you can kind of see it. Well, here's 95, right? I like using this example because I think we're in a very similar situation. Let me click off this magnet and redo this. Actually, I can probably just drag it now, right? So you start looking at this and going, okay, let's go out to 01 and you start looking at that area Okay, that's the kind of ranges that you're gonna just start seeing that are just gonna be normalized, right? And we're talking about this as if it's chaos, okay? So, you see, I mean, you see where I'm going with this? Like the volatility, 8%, then you're at 4%, then you're back to 7%. And people are looking at this going, oh, we were at 360 and now we're at four. You haven't seen volatility yet like you're about to see. That's my personal opinion of what's happening in this market me analyzing data, not predicting. I think the volatility on all these assets is gonna go up dramatically. Now, when we would trade, I'll give you an example and then we'll get back on point. When, when we were trading Cisco, like back in the day, I've been trading for about over, a little over 20 years for people that don't know. But we had times where you were buying like here and you're paying 17, 18 bucks and then you come in one day, it's at 10, right? And then the next thing you know, it rips. I mean, we went through this all the time where you just didn't know. And it basically became, you know, it was like holding a Bronco. It was not a straight line. So that's a very different period of time. And people aren't aware of that, that that's what they're going to go through. So please keep that in mind. It's very, very important. I think it's created an opportunity because what we're starting to see is they're just throwing everything out the window. So apparently every building that's office space in New York is now worth zero according to um, the bears that are out there, right? Like, it's just absolutely silly. Uh, look, they're not gonna convert these to residential buildings. If you know anything about construction, and I, I know of a, fair, a fairly decent amount about construction, uh, they're not gonna convert these. What's gonna happen is eventually they're gonna get control of the labor force because people are gonna need their jobs more than they do right now. And they're gonna tell people to get back in the office. Or if you want that promotion or whatever, you're gonna to have to move to this location and get that job. I would argue that I've seen more people recently having to move locations instead of being remote for work than we have in the previous couple of years. That said, let's just say that every, let's just agree on the fact that every office space is not gonna be worth zero. And you look at how this is shaping up. And I'm specifically talking about me metropolitan areas like New York, like to convert an office building in New York to residential, you're looking at a decade. So if you take a look at this and it's not cost effective at all, but if you take a look at this, right, you have the undercut here, you have the undercut here, and then you're holding, right? Okay, so now we're holding in this area and we're trying to flip, but We'll note right here that if we take a look at the RSI, that that RSI, let's pull that up. Let's pull this up a little bit with it. There we go. That RSI is getting back over that 50 level. So if we can get back over that 50 level, we have another shot here. I would argue that what we just recently saw with SLG and their move solidifies a lot. So SLG is a great example of what I'm talking about here, and then we'll do Vernado. But what we've been discussing and looking at here is the volumes picking up. They just sold 245 Park, 50% of it for 2 billion, something like that, which actually marks their entire book value, which is roughly 70 bucks or $77. I went over this one like about two weeks ago. I guess it was around 27, 28 then. And the reason I'm bringing this up is all these videos are connected, right? We stay and we watch the same names. Sometimes we add different names, but we want to see how our thesis plays out, okay? It's not just, I'm just not out there. If people get a little confused about how I, you know, how I trade, I, do I day trade? Yes. I'm much more interested in swing trades and long-term positions because that's how real money's made, despite what you'll see on TV where we're on these ads where you see somebody trading from a mountaintop or, or a yacht and telling you it takes 15 minutes a day. So anyway, you see these levels right here and how you can kind of go across, You're setting up to break out. $77 book value. So you look at it and go, okay, well, what if they're wrong on their book value? Okay, what are they off by? Are they off by 
Are they off by 20%? Are they off by 30%? Let's just say that they're off by 20%, right? Let's just say that it's not $77. Okay, well, that would just be 77, take, you know, take 15 off of that. It's called 60, 62 bucks. I'm at $31, okay? And they're still paying their dividend. And that's what I would focus on. I'd focus on the ones that are still paying their dividend. I know a lot of people are looking at Fernando and, and saying, well, that one's cheaper, but there's a reason it's cheaper. It also suspended its dividend. It also suspended its biggest project in New York. So that would be more of a red flag. Now, that could also mean it's more levered and that might offer a better return for you because of that. But I, I would not sleep on this. I would be paying attention to these names. I think there's something there that's worth paying attention. What we have here is a situation where institutions are actually going out there and starting to buy stocks. Now, you are seeing a lot of froth up here, right? You can see where that market is right there. But you are starting to see a lot of froth right there, okay? And that is dumb money, or as we refer to it, retail. And if we take a look at this, what I would just argue is the spread is really what I'm interested in. This spread is very important to me. And the wider the spread for me, the better the opportunity, right? Because you have a huge disconnect. Now you can see this spread here and you can see how that played out, right? And you can see this spread here and you can see how that played out. For me, the most important one that I found that I thought was the closest to, to the width that we're currently at, you can see this through the confidence spread, I'll show you that in a moment, is going to be something like here, where, let me go back to this level. So you start seeing these back here. Okay, these kinds of areas are the most impactful to me. Now, if you take a look at the actual spread, so this is the spread in ratio form, and what you're gonna see is the following. This is the area where we're down, and then you start looking and go, well, when was the last time we were here? Well, that was in this area. Okay, well, that was in this area here, and then, of course, here. Okay, all those times we rallied, let's go out 10 years and take a look. And then you start going back and going, okay, well, Looks to me like that was 14, 15, and all those areas we did what? We rallied. Okay. I think that's an important distinction. You go back 20 years and you're going to see all these little areas where you rejected and then what did you do? You started to rally. I think it's a very important distinction that a lot of people are not paying attention to. Here you are on the yearly basis and you can see this. And I think it's very important. What you're looking for is you're looking for extremes. Now you have these extremes up here as well when you were inverted the other way. They're somewhat marking bottoms. I, I don't know that we're marking a bottom. What I'm simply saying is that when you're in this area, you tend to then push, right? When you're pushing, you can see that kind of change that we're talking about. So I wanna see this get closer and closer together now and start seeing how we act. Are, is retail going to dump onto institutions and institutions not be able to eat all that you know, supply? I, I don't know. I don't think that that's what we're about to face, quite frankly. But I don't have an answer to that yet. I know that this is significant and that it's an extreme reading. And when I'm at extreme readings, I want to pay attention to that. I also know to go back to the most previous extreme reading that I have and then look at what happened during that period of time. The closer in proximity to that movement, the greater the degree of correlation, in my opinion, it, it usually works that way. So I wanna take a look at it, I wanna watch it, but I have to see how it plays out. Now, one of the things I'd like to go over is just the new highs, new lows. So we're not seeing new lows, despite what people are saying, the breath, the breath, the breath. And I just want to point this out. So this is new highs, new lows, and you can kind of see how this has been playing out. You're really not hitting those levels of new lows anymore. And you come across here, you're hitting new highs. And this is exactly what you want to see, right? Now, if you overlaid this graph with what we just looked at with smart money, dumb money, this would make more sense that we're correlating to this. We're going to have to see how it plays out, but that's how I'm looking at it right now. And I think that that's important. If new highs, new lows were down here, well, that would be a concern, but that's not the case and that's not what we're dealing with. Now, I also think it's important. I always want to look at what insiders are doing. Now, this is something that you would utilize long-term, corporate insider buys. So what you would look at is you would come in here and say, okay, well, we're holding in that level. This is the highest amount of corporate insider buys that we've had in a decade. Let's go out 15 years. Highest corporate insider buys for the NDX in 15 years. Highest 
buys going out to 11. And I think that's about as far back as this goes. It goes back to 10. So that's as far back as we have data. So from 2010 to date, we have not had a period of time where we have bought more than we did here, period. It's not even a question. So the way that this works is that always, you always want to see what insiders are doing. The way this works is simple. It's insiders, right? Then it's institutions, then it's retail in that order. You always want to see what people are doing that own the company first. Now, with that said, you always want to check, okay, well, maybe, maybe this huge buying, well, maybe they're, maybe they're getting out now. You have the lowest level of buying in 10 or of selling in 10 years, rather. Okay. You have the lowest level of selling, right? You'd have to go back to the 12th, 2012 to find anything like this. Okay. Where you're this troughed out on the market. So insiders are buying at a record clip at least 10 years, because that's what the data goes back and they're not selling. They're not even anywhere near a median line. They're still at historic lows. So people in charge of the companies in the NASDAQ long term, they think long term, they don't think weekly, are buying their stock at historic levels and they're not selling their stocks at historic levels. They're actually at lows at historic levels. Something to think about. Now, the best performing sector on Friday was oil and gas. And I don't think anybody would have thought that oil and gas was going to be the best performing sector. I certainly didn't. But here we are with this kind of volume, which is absolutely insane considering where we've been. We're just looking at a daily chart here, but you see this reversal. Look, there's a couple of reasons for this. People are talking about, oh, it's gonna be the SPR. They're gonna drill and that's where the oil is gonna come from. Uh, could be the rig count. There's a whole myriad of reasons. You can always comment below is why you think that oil rallied. For me, I'm just looking at this going, okay, oil's rallying. We're looking for the next driver. Is that driver this, the most beaten down sector that's been there? And there's a possibility that it is. Now, one of the names I was looking at, I know a lot of people are looking at the Schlumbergers and the Hal Halbertons. This is pretty interesting to me because I have a six month base just sitting here. Smaller cap name, but you can see that you have major support just sitting in these levels. So I'm not so sure that we have any chance of even breaking this anymore. I mean, this looks almost too perfect. Tries to rally, can't, consolidates for a couple months, tries to rally and break out. If we go take a look at this on the weekly, uh, this gets pretty obvious where volume dries up and then we start getting buying and buying, starting to curl on the RSI. I like this. And this is definitely one that I'll be watching. I think it's I think it's worth on your radar. Now I'm starting to try to figure out if it's washed out or not. This was something I did exceptionally well with. If they start drilling again and they start drilling more, names like these royalty trusts eventually will start to catch up. Now, this actually moved on Friday. And I thought that was really interesting. It moved on that news. So, and this is a pretty decent sized move forward. I think it's like a 10% move or something. But look at that little volume spike. Well, the majority of people that actually even know that BPT exists are insiders, which I just went over, but that's for NDX. I would start looking at things like this and start saying, are you gonna start seeing that kind of volume again? Now, there's a couple key readings that I use. And to me, candidly, this is pretty exhausted. The, the selling to me looks pretty exhausted. If I go out on a weekly and I look at this level, this is usually where that exhaustion kind of kicks in. So I, I do like this and it's definitely something that would be on my radar. One of the metrics I use and I would suggest you do as well is S&P stocks above the 200 day moving average. And we can see that we're still above the 50 line. As long as we're above that 50, that's pretty substantial. Usually the majority of big moves that happen in the S&P are from that. If we come here and take a look at stocks above the five day, you're more towards the tail end, right? In other words, when you're up here, that's usually when you have short term pullbacks. It's pretty rare to have short term pullbacks when you're here right now. We can come across here and I'll just drop this down so you can see it. It doesn't mean that you can't go lower, right? You have this whole area right in here where you clearly you've gone lower. It's just not that common, right? It's really not that common for this to get much lower. So that usually is a sign of a, a short term bottom, but 
you can get in here. You could still you could still have an extreme move, and I think that's important to to note. What we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze and then utilize that information going forward to just make better decisions. Hope that's helpful. I covered a wide range of areas today on purpose. If you liked that, comment below. That's it.